Excellent. Okay, understanding mortgages in Portugal. Uh, good evening to you. Thank you for joining this Portugal Calling webinar. Astrid, where are you in Portugal this evening? I'm in Cascais at the moment, Carl. Excellent stuff. And um, we're, we're celebrating uh, Expats Portugal because, of course, we reached another milestone with the community. Yes, we reached 11,000 members on our forum on the website, which is very exciting. So, um, yeah. congratulations. Oh, yeah, 11,000. So, that's pretty amazing. Okay, wonderful. Okay, well, thank you, everybody, uh, for being part of the uh, community over at expatsportugal.com. Thanks for being on the webinar tonight. We have our special guest, Jacqueline Mullen from Mortgage Direct SL. Uh, Jacqueline, Hello. so where, where are you in the world this evening? Uh, well, I'm very north up in Portugal, like uh, Netherlands, but it's in <laughs> it's, it's Maastricht, which was the foundation of the European Union. So technically, yes. I'm sort of part of Portugal. As a Brit, I've heard of that. Yeah. Yes. Um, and uh, yes, that northern part of Portugal known as uh, the Netherlands this evening. Thank you for joining <laughs> us. Uh, could you tell us about your company, uh, Mortgage Direct SL, who can be found, of course, on the Expats Portugal business directory. So tell us about what your company does. Of course. So we are uh, Mortgage Direct. I'm one, just one of the members, not just about me, but um, I'd like to be with, uh, with Carl on the show. It's always very fun. And we started the company about 17 years ago in Spain. We worked together with a uh, place in the sun, also a very famous portal that was always showing people around to nice places in sunny, sunny locations. Mm -hmm. And that's where we got to grow our business from basically identifying there was a need between people who didn't understand the local reality in Spain, but still want to buy property. And through the years, we I joined the company seven years ago. I'm the Portuguese one of the Portuguese speakers, so it made sense to extend into Portugal. So we've been doing that for seven years now, more or less too. And we've been we're still growing, like not on a monthly, well, actually on a monthly basis. It's insane. It's uh, it's it's nice to identify there are so many people who like to talk to someone either in their own language or, you know, yeah, especially their own language to understand quite a daunting process how to go about getting finance in another country. So that's basically where we come in. We understand the Portuguese reality. Most of us or all of us speak Portuguese, so we can level between where you're coming from. The team is multinational anyway, uh, or multi cultural And we yeah, we've been doing it very successfully in Portugal, too, for the past seven years. Excellent. Good stuff. Thank you, Leif. Uh, talk about mortgage interest rate trends. We will get to that because these are exciting times fiscally, aren't they, in the world at the moment? And I think yeah. Portugal, uh, fair to say, occupies a, a safe and steady position as much as is possible in this day and age anyway. Um, so that's the company. Uh, what about you? Um, did you sit on the end of your bed as a little girl thinking, one day I'm going to be a mortgage advisor? Um. Not real, but you could say my mom has a link there. She's good with languages too. And this is kind of a pivotal thing. Um, I was intrigued to study economics, business, travel the world, that everything rolled into one, uh, ended up me being a mortgage broker for Portugal and Spain. This works perfectly for you. <laughs> Yeah, we, and we have talked to you from time to time. Sorry, just to digress a little bit, to, to, just to get to know uh, Jacqueline a little better for some of you here who don't know her. You love dancing, don't you? And we saw you uh, the last one of the shows a couple of times ago, or even the last webinar, actually. You were in Brazil at the time yes. of the carnival. How was that? Amazing. These people really love to party, dance, make friends, make fun, dance some more, make some more music, make some caipirinhas in a beach tropical setting. It's like, as magical as I'm describing it, that is exactly what it is. Yeah. Superb, excellent. Good. And yeah. are you are you you you're a, a, a professional dancer at times, or you've been or, or an excellent amateur? I would say that I'm pretty good at doing mortgages, and I'm not bad at dancing. But I wouldn't say that I'm at the same level, and I never pursued it professionally. But we were like a semi-professional show group, and I realized after I finished the group when I was 28, so quite a while ago. Um, that we've been dancing 10 years to a Brazilian song that I didn't know was Brazilian until I actually set foot in Brazil for the first time. I was like, hey, wait a minute. I know that song. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, I did it pretty seriously, but not. Um, uh, we got a lot of uh, recommendation, uh, how do you say it? appreciation, but never paid for it myself. So okay. this is. A, you haven't just... lost your skills. OK, so we're going to take yeah. to the financial dance floor now and work out how to shimmy with uh, financiers 
uh, when it comes to raising finance for your property. Uh, that was a really good uh, question from Leaf or an observation or a suggestion to us. Um, other questions, very welcome. And uh, when we when we turn the recording off, of course, that's a time for people to maybe ask questions that they might want to, not want to ask in a, in a huge internet based public forum. But um, do do ask your questions now or prompt us in the chat or wait until after the recording is over if you want to ask something of a more personal and specific, unique nature. Um, yes, these um, mortgage interest rate trends, then it's the big topic, of course, isn't it? People want to know what they're going to be up against interest rate wise. How's it looking then for Portugal as a place in the the whole financial world right now? These are yeah. times, aren't they? I mean, you're absolutely right, Carl. Like, let's place it within the framework of what's happening in the world. We see some uh, disruptions and European peacefulness that we've had for a long time. Uh, hopefully, this is going to play out well. And uh, yeah, sincere uh, thoughts to everyone who's directly involved with any kind of conflict. But what you see happening in the markets and the financial ones that they're all responding to that. And interest rates have been increasing. We've seen some inflation has been going up. So the European Central Bank is actually increasing the rates for a long, long time. We have had a negative Euribor for the past seven years, and it's the first time it's above zero. But when you take it on a whole, and if I compare it to the other reality, I do know pretty well uh, Spain, Portugal is still quite competitive at the moment, meaning that uh, in the US, for example, I've heard of rates around 6% mark, and we're still looking at somewhere between 2 to 3% for uh, and a large period of that, you can even fix the rate. So for 10, 15 years, you could fix it at something pretty decent in current day's reality. I can't guarantee that's going to be the same because this can change and we do, we expect it for the rest of the year to creep up a little bit more, but then hopefully next year it's going to calm down a bit. But a lot of people actually are now locking in mortgages because they 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 have been historically so low for the past year because Euribor was below zero. That's just an unknown. So now we're seeing kind of what we'd be expected interest rates from um, yeah, from a commercial perspective, but also what is the reality of the, the market as a whole. So yeah, it's still a good time and a lot of people are actually are buying at the moment. Yeah, and the, and the context for Portugal, of course, is it's, it's something of a conservative atmosphere in banking, isn't it? It's not Wild West uh, give, throwing money out all over the place. There, there, there's quite a, I don't know if strict is the right word, but it's measured here, isn't it? And conservative in the financial yeah. Well, uh, in the whole of Europe and since 2008, there was a big reaction around the world to secure, uh, well, basically to protect consumers from not taking out loans that they couldn't carry and things like that. So you would definitely say see that from 2008, much more regulation has been put in place, also demanded from a public viewpoint that uh, people are forcing that just to avoid that people would be, you know, uh, put out of their houses or w weren't able to, to pay their mortgage obligations anymore. And also bear in mind that almost everyone, and I think it applies to everyone here almost, is that you're coming from a country, so you're paying taxes in another country, but not in Portugal. So the risk profile that everyone is that's not part of this reality in Portugal is different from someone who has been their whole life in Portugal, because the likeliness of default of someone who's from the country is very small because it's your main residence and you really depend on it to you know, continue your work and everything. Whereas if it's a second residence or you're paying taxes in another country, you could be inclined to go back to that reality and just, you know, drop the keys off at the banks in the box, the post office. This really happened in the 2008 crisis. Yes, they did. Okay, right. People just dropped the keys at the bank, took off in the night and uh, never looked back. So wow. that that is why there's two parts to it. So yes, it's been much more regulated since ever. And I, we really... I think it's it's a healthy thing because it's in the end it's protecting consumers, making sure no one's taking out loans that they can't carry. And on the other hand, um, banks have become they're still very willing to lend. Not every bank, not everyone is offering something interesting, but um, they do see that market that there's a lot of appetite for it. So they they really are keen to to lend, but they do take a bit of caution there. Yeah also because of not being a resident of the country yet. So quite a cautious country by nature in terms of finance. And then the added dimension, if you're a foreigner, there may be added uh, security required or that certainly the, take that kind of view of your borrowing here. Yeah. Great to have people in tonight from South Africa, Texas, Arizona, Florida. Thank you for being here, everybody. Thank you, Howard, for your thanks uh, to us for putting this on this evening. 
And um, uh, yeah, uh, just to stay in the global picture for a moment, thank you, Chris, for your observation. Heard the EU is trying to aggressive up the US, which I, I suppose is maybe push back against a little bit of the control that the US has over the world economy. Are you hearing anything like that? The, Chris says inflation is nuts, uh, probably referring to the US. Uh, mm -hmm. how, how would you uh, respond to that? <clears throat> All of these, um, like all of our realities are connected. So we can talk of a world where the US is doing something and Europe is, you know, on a side playing their own game. Yeah. It, yes, it is to some extent for sure, but you see that all of it is interacting. Within the EU, EU all countries have their own economic and social reality too. Mm -hmm. And then the European Central Bank has their policies in order to prevent what I was just explaining in my previous point where, you know, about protection and things like that and lending rates and making sure that, you know, the inflation is capped or is at least, you know, a slowdown. And that is the tools that they have to their disposal. But within the country itself, we, even within Portugal and Spain, which are like next to each other, we see both are increasing, but not increasing at the same rate, at least right now. So what is happening in the U.S. is not directly impacting Portugal, but that it's interconnected for sure. We can't, we are too internationally like a world where everything is, yeah, we're becoming one. If butterfly, you will. A, blood, a butterfly flaps its wings, as it were, yes, uh, somewhere. Yeah. And the effect is felt elsewhere. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that that bigger picture. So let's get into the specifics then of uh, borrowing and financing uh, here in Portugal. Um, I guess one of the, the 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 perennial questions we get is age limit. Um, let's yeah. let's start with the lower age limit and then deal with the upper age limit <laughs> and the strategies the strategies for dealing with that. How young could you be to have a mortgage here? Uh, legally, when you're 18, you're right. You have the right to go to a notary and sign something to your name. It doesn't happen a lot. We have 18 year old applicants um, and the banks are not too keen because they usually when you're 18, you don't have a history of credit. You don't have any way for a bank to establish how well can you manage debts in these sizes so or in any size. Um, so the preferred age is somewhere in the middle of 40s because that's, you know, people have had a long enough career usually or a lifespan that they have had either a home mortgage or a car loan or some kind of loans to their name so you can establish if they're good candidates to lend money to and usually they're you know at an age where you can actually um yeah afford to buy down a property but anything in between i would say anything from 35 it starts to make sense and it's the logical age but it's for a second residence which is a lot for our buyers um usually doesn't happen at the age of 20 because unless you were very fortunate and someone gifted you the money then usually you wouldn't have that kind of money laying around in order to do this investment so that's the lower age one uh, the upper age is 75 so most banks want are almost they can potentially do it up to age of 80 but almost no bank is offering that to non-residents so 75 is the safe number to work with in terms of when should it be paid off Okay, excellent. I was I was referring with the lower age limits. Probably you're going to get calls eventually from digital nomads and these young, very well off people who might want yeah. to borrow some money in their. In their uh, we we have a few of that too. We have yeah. a few people that are uh, uh, going around the world and then decide, you know, I'm going to live in a place like Portugal because it's warm, sunny. It's still in Europe if they have European roots. Um, it's still quite safe and it's easy to travel to other destinations again. That too, yeah. 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 OK. And then with the upper age limit, somebody might be here tonight celebrating their 76th birthday and thinking, oh, um, how, what's the strategy for them? Uh, get a younger spouse. Excellent. <laughs> Maybe we can arrange that on the forum. OK, so to, how would that so, work? We can add an additional layer to like uh, find your match if you want to live together in Portugal. I, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, it's 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 honestly a recommendation I got from one of the banks myself when I asked like if someone like me who works digitally and I would want to purchase but I'm not declaring in Portugal and his advice was find a Portuguese man. I'm not joking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not joking. Like, <laughs> Isn't it weird that a lot of yeah. people aren't allowed to give financial advice in this world, but everyone is able to give relationship advice by the sound of it? Okay. <laughs> we have the credentials to give the financial advice. I'm not giving any That's any right. guarantees on relationship advice. No, okay. it's not where I'm coming from. Okay, but is that with that combo, if you have somebody over 75 and somebody under, they will look to the younger person in the partnership? Can happen. It right. really depends on the equation of that relationship, the income, debt structure, everything. They they tend to look at the couple as a whole, and especially if you are married, yeah. not under separation of goods, with, uh, then, then they can't really separate you. But some banks can take a creative view of that. Okay, 
All right, we like the sound of that. Um, very good. Uh, so that's the the age limits dealt with there. Let's talk about deposits, shall we? And and what maybe what we could do is go through a kind of case study, uh, you know, um, a randomised sort of case study of, yep. of the process of working with you. But before we do that, people want to know how much they need to put down, um, yep. how much of their you know their 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 uh, asset will need to be put down as deposit. How would that work with with the bank? Okay, so the simplest um, starting point is the bank is going to lend you maximum seventy percent of the property price. So just work with a round number. It's 100,000, 70,000 the bank is going to give you maximum. So you need to put down 30,000. This is not a common number, but I'm just giving it as a everyone to follow easily kind of example. And then, so you need to put down 30,000 and you need to calculate with somewhere between eight to 10% for fees and taxes. So that's another almost 10,000 slapped on there. So you want to buy 100,000, you need 40,000 of yeah. your own funds. Okay. And that really needs to come from an asset that you've sold, like a property yes. or um, savings really, or any investments that you sold, but it cannot be from another borrower. So if you went to your own bank in your home country and then ask for, to take some equity out of the property that you have to put down in Portugal and then get the other part, they would see that you're borrowing actually more than 70%, which kind of uh, takes out the whole risk. Um, yes. they, they want you to really feel that you're putting in your own money. That's yes. kind of the bottom line. Not no. 2007 again. <laughs> no. Right. no. Um, and there's that conservatism again at uh, work. Okay, which is probably no bad thing in, in reality. No. Okay, so um, 30%, 70%, whichever way you look at it. Um, yeah, well, what, so, so that process then of um, somebody applying, uh, what, what, what are they going to look to? You said, you know, you can't, you can't have a whip round of, of funders and have some coming in from there and some coming from here. You've got to have uh, about on 100,000, about 40K of your own money. Um, mm -hmm. But how do you prove income then? What are the, the uh, approved ways of, of showing what your income is? Because they're going to need to see that as well, right? Yeah. So they like to see your tax returns. Mm -hmm. They have to show the income that you claim to earn. Um, and you can either be self-employed or you can have be employed by a company, either one of them. Retirement funds can be used. Um, you can use uh, rental income. That's also an accepted form of income, but that should be for what they call quality contracts. So it cannot be uh, renting out your place in Airbnb and then having you know a multitude of, of tourists coming through. It should really be someone who's with a contract of you, and then they consider that too as a valid source of income. Although based on rental income alone, it would be hard to get a mortgage proof. But I mean. We've seen all kinds of constructs and uh, the ideal picture for any bank is somewhere between 45, 55, couple, two jobs or self-employed with perhaps another property that they rent out and have rental income from. So all of that income should be able to be identified in your statements like tax returns, um, your uh, bank statements, uh, employment, uh, your, your pay slips, etc. this kind of thing. Okay, forgive me if you did mention this already. Chris, Chris is asking, is a retirement income seen differently to other incomes? So pensions and other, other funds coming through in retirement, would they be considered as, as worthy of consideration as, 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 as the uh, income proof? Absolutely, as long as it's uh, guaranteed for life or you know, there should be a, a guarantee in there. If that's kind of a pension that you can take out, you can take sums out annually and it's going to end at some point, it's different. But if you have an income that's guaranteed, whether it's government, private pension, that can all be included for the application. Yes. Perfect. Okay, thanks, Rory and, and Laurie as well. We'll come back to your, your input uh, there. But let's, if we may, just do a quick uh, case study slash timeline here. Um, somebody's watching the webinar, they want to borrow or find out if it's possible. They get in touch mm -hmm. with you. Can you talk us through that process and um, timeline as well as requirements of that person? Yeah. So basically what I do, if anyone has to show uh, reaches out to me, I will ask you to fill out our application form. We do our best to get back to you in two days, but we've been a bit stretched recently because of um, the reality that we have. It's not that we, ha we do have a lot of applicants still, but also a lot of questions because of the volatility of the market, if you will. Mm -hmm. And we're in August, almost two days, three days from now. So um, that would slow things down. But let's say we're not in August, we're not in summer and we're looking at normal timelines, it would be somewhere between, um, so we have the application form, I do the analysis or one of my colleagues does the analysis, we tell you what we think is possible or we have initial chat, like we are not sure if we're understanding you correctly. So we're gonna ask a few more questions just to make it really sure that we, we have a good uh, grasp of your 
of your profile. And then based on that, we will do, um, we will send you a quote, what we think we could achieve. It's, again, it's not guaranteed, but it's think what we can achieve. And then if you want to proceed on that basis, we would introduce you uh, to the best lender suited to your profile or to multiple if we have options there. But we would always, um, we tend to go for the best one offering the best conditions at the market because we do get that updated uh, regularly by the bank. So we kind of know what's uh, competitive, what's most competitive at the moment. And that would take, well, I would say under normal circumstances, we would be there from two to four weeks, but now we see some delays and I'm definitely adding um, two weeks to a month sometimes just to get the first feedback from the bank. It's still quicker than if you would do it yourself because they're just, they're really swamped with, uh, with a lot of clients knocking on the door and half the staff is on holiday as of <laughs> in two days. So yep. they're really working with a skeleton crew. Yep. Uh, answering to many more demands. A lot of people are holidaying in the country too. And then they think, oh, we're going to have a property here. And then they, you know, that that's just a kind of a face thing. And it also goes away. I'm sure it's not applicable to anyone in the audience today, but a lot of people have this romantic idea and they get really swamped, swept off their feet by the reality. Um, so there is an increase in demand even in the summer months, but less people to, <laughs> to work <laughs> that are at the banks that we can knock on the doors. No, it is um, worth making that point, isn't it? I mean, because it's a general point about Portuguese culture. Um, yeah. So if you are going to be here on holiday in August, um, everything pretty much slows down. It is the holiday month of Portuguese people. Uh, yeah. and as uh, Jacqueline's saying there, if you're on holiday and you fall in love with the property, you probably won't be able to walk into a bank hand in hand uh, with a big bag of money or and as a deposit and say, can we get this done and dusted yeah. uh, no. before we go home? Probably not going to happen. So you were looking at, generally speaking, two to four weeks, but an additional, I'm going to call it a premium, a time yeah. of another two to four weeks because of the yeah. upcoming, upcoming August effect, right? Yeah, that and the, the disruptions we have in the markets around, the, that's what's happening already for a couple of months, weeks now, ever since we had the conflict in, yeah. in the Ukraine-Russia area. Um, okay. And then we have that first part, of course. Yeah, what's, the, what's your quickest turnaround as a matter of interest? Oh, I've had one in one day, like, but like, I mean, yeah, no, really, but okay. that, that is something that is really out of the ordinary because we have two things here. We have banks that can approve you at the branch level, yeah. but that's not a common thing. If they can do that, it has to meet a bunch of requirements. So that means like they have to meet this, this, and this, and that, and then this would work. If they have any, not, they don't tick any of those boxes or they are ticking some other box, they have to go to the risk assessment department anyway. So that means not a layer within the bank, which is the usual process. Yeah. So, but I've had it really that I've got a mortgage offered through the same day that I've asked for it. This is not a signed mortgage, but at least the client knows that they're going to get the money from the bank. Yeah. Okay. Good to know. Sorry, I interrupted you. No, 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 <laughs> no, it's good. Um, so we have that um, first initial phase. Then it also depends on where is the client in the process. This is really important. It's not just about getting the mortgage because getting the mortgage and buying the property comes with a lot of other things that need to be set in place. So that opening a bank account, getting a NIF number, first a NIF number, which is tax number in Portugal. Um, you need at least a NIF number to have the bank account active. And then you might need to be in Portugal to open a bank account or not, but in general, you have to be here. And then um, you are going to do a property valuation. And so the way we arrange it with the banks is that first we have the first analysis assessment, which doesn't cost the client anything up until that stage. There's no cost involved. Only when we have the bank saying, yes, this, these clients are good to go and they can borrow the funds they're looking for. Only at that stage would uh, we open a bank account, instruct a valuation of the property, and that would be the first cost to the client. So then the property valuation is done. If you've locked, if you found a property, of course, that's kind of vital in that step too, because sometimes clients are not with a property yet. And then, you know, when they have that feedback, they can borrow, then they're going to start looking for property. So everyone's personal uh, road, if you will, also determines how long it's going to take. Yeah. Valuation done takes another week or so to add to the whole process. And then from that point, you can start preparing everything to finalize the official mortgage letter, which is the binding agreement between you and the bank. Yeah. And that's when you're going to head to the notary and sign it off. And then you get the keys to your new home. Excellent stuff. Okay, that's great. Um, and of course, Ian, before we go to more general questions here, um, interest rates then. We talked about the trends, didn't we? The worldwide trends, but I'm not sure you quoted any specific rates currently that you're working with. 
I said somewhere between two to three percent, I think, at the beginning. And I think I said something similar two days ago. If, and I'm talking here about fixed rates for a period of time, um, we see banks even offering as low as 1.162. But that is then also subject to product. So then it becomes more of an equation of like what kind of product are you going to take out or not? And what is most vital to me? But definitely it could be even lower than what I just mentioned. Okay. And that's today. I really have to add that as a disclaimer. Like um, that's today. And it could be something very different tomorrow. I hope not, because it's going to make my life more difficult. Well, no, but that, that does need to be said, of course, as, as, as we've yeah. said a number of times tonight. It's a volatile um, area of life and things may change, of course. It's, it's indicative yeah. tonight, the information we are giving. Um, Howard's asking, what's the process for 100% cash purchase? Not really a question for tonight, is it? Although I would say, um, and, and you, I don't know how, how much you would want to, uh, how much of an opinion you want to offer on this. Um, we do have other experts. We work with Howard who can help you buy uh, somewhere if you've got 100% cash and you just want to go w- with that without borrowing. But if somebody has got 100% cash ready to buy, isn't now a good time to consider a mortgage anyway uh, because the interest rates are low and then put that put the um you know some more, some money to work elsewhere. This is a common strategy and I, I think that uh, people are a bit financially savvy, they do that. They don't want to put all their money into sticks, and bricks and stones because, well, it's stuck there. You can't really eat from it or you cannot enjoy a nice uh, uh, Portuguese pastel in Lisbon or whatever nice things they're offering. But yeah. so this is, yeah, the, the, most people take it as a leverage strategy and then use the money elsewhere for investments that give them a bigger return versus putting it in a property. But it's a, it's also kind of a personal choice. If you don't want to think about paying mortgages anymore, then you know, that's the H, the H thing comes into play as well. At some point, people just, you know, can't be bothered or don't want to think about it. So that could be a, a reason. But but you could scale people- down, couldn't you? You could scale down and use some of the money and, and, yeah. and use finance to create an income stream effectively as well. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Not again, not advice. Just just, just, <laughs> just a, a, an indication. Brainstorming. <laughs> yes, brainstorming uh, live on the webinar here. Um, and uh, you mentioned the costs um, that, pe- that need to be factored in at 10%. What are they specifically? And co- this is probably a good time to talk about insurances as well that people need to take out. Um, yeah, so from the, when I mentioned 10%, I'm not even talking about the insurances. This okay. is just uh, regardless of you buying a property in cash or with a mortgage, you're looking, give or take, at that 10% because the majority of it is really the property tax. So um, there's some other fees that you have to reckon with. So I recommend, and I hardly recommend anyone on the show thinking about it, really you need a lawyer because you're buying in another country. You do, know, do not know the language and the, the cultural uh, implications of it. And you don't know the property's history. And that's where the lawyer steps in. He's going to make sure that you know, the property you're buying is free of any uh, debts and things like that. You just want to make sure that everything is in place. So that's an additional cost you would have. Um, from the mortgage itself, you don't generate a lot of additional costs. There are some. So the banks charge like uh, the administration fees, the valuation of costs, of course. But we're talking about 1%, 2%, not even like really minimum of that whole 10% pie that I was talking about. Yeah, yeah. So the, really the, the big chunk is coming from the um, property tax, which depending on the price of the property, how much tax you're paying, that's the reality. All right, and that's that, 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 you, that sort of level of detail you can advise people on personally yeah. when they get to that stage. Okay, and then the life insurance. Um, maybe you could tie in a response uh, to this uh, message from, from John. Thank you. I understand there is a requirement to get life insurance with a mortgage and that this can make overall cost more expensive than the mortgage rate how would you respond to that yeah this can happen so when i said we can offer rates that are even lower than the two percent i was talking about this could be because the bank wants you to take out life insurance sometimes they insist on that because they have identified a risk within the applicants that can be a reason uh partially is also really commercially motivated because it makes money for the bank it's really that simple it's a risk um reduction recorded and also a um, way to, to add some products. And they want to make you, like they also really want to capture you as a client, build a relationship. And the more products you have with them, the more you become part of, um, yeah, of the bank's circle, if you will. Yes, yeah, yes. And they, yeah. Okay. And, and that's where it could, it could kind of escalate. So you've got a nice uh, low interest rate, but you've got quite a hefty life insurance premium to pay possibly. Yeah. And, that, and that's where we, I think we can really make a difference because we can 
look at each applicant's profile and then come up with what is the best solution for you. So it could be that the life insurance option bank is your best option because you, under at the end of the day, you're still paying the lowest in total in terms of the interest rate and of the, and the life cover included. Of course, the older you get, the heftier the fees could be. But at some age, even they cannot offer life insurance anymore because it has to do with risk as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's kind of um, something that we really try to establish and always look for the best solution in each specific case for each client. So I think it's we really make it personal. It's not a one-size-fits-all solution that we offer. No, and a number of different lenders. And that's a question from Kevin. How many banks do you work with that lend in Portugal? I suppose it's organizations, institutions, rather than specifically banks, right? Um, we tend to work with, uh, so we have bodies that oversee areas and we tend to work with all, we have contracts with the main offices. That's kind of, that's just how the market works, but we tend to work with branches either where the client is buying, or we tend to work with the branches that we just have good relationships with. And where we know that we have some leverage negotiation power, uh, we get better service that this in the end is way more important than anything else because it doesn't matter if you go to this branch or that branch or that branch mm-hmm. in sense of what kind of products are they offering you but it does make all the difference in what kind of service levels are you getting and the more these people are familiar with seeing a u.s tax return for example the more likely they're going to have a quicker service level than a bank that's never looked at a foreign tax statement a quality rather than quantity of lenders <laughs> I'm, I'm gleaning from that okay yeah. and, yeah. and then the proven track records of working with people okay um th- rory i think we'll come to your question after the recording and then you can chip in yourself with that um somebody was asking about a construction mortgage does that ring any bells for you yeah we do them too okay. um the where this this yes we do them and you can have a mortgage and in in principle it comes down more or less to the same thing however the big difference that we see is that with construction mortgages you definitely need a lawyer even more so than if you're buying a regular house, which you always need in any case, but um, you need to go through a lot of regulatory bodies to get all your licenses in place in order to build. If you're starting from scratch, so you buy a piece of land and you're going to build in that. Um, If you're doing some kind of remodeling, it's a bit of a different story, but still in many cases, you need to get a license and there you really need the help of someone who really knows (laughs) which doors to knock on and how to open them and to make sure that you get everything in place and that just slows it down. So um, in any case, if you want to get a bank to look at your application, you would have to have the land already registered in your name. So you're the legal owner. You need to make sure that the land is, of course, before you buy it, make sure that you can actually build on it. And it wasn't like part of a farmland where they were just growing olive trees. Then probably you cannot buy, you cannot build anything on it more than a shed for your tools yes and uh, not a villa with a swimming pool and a nice uh, bathroom kitchen everything no so um that you need to have legally really uh sorted and yeah. you need to have all the uh oh god i forgot the name uh the the, little, the certificates you need to have all the licenses in place that you can actually build them and oh, then the permit, the permit to permits, build exactly Okay, got right. it. All right. Uh, and everyone involved there. Yes. And that's where you definitely need legal help. Not just the nice man who sold you the uh, land in the cafe saying it's going to be fine. <laughs> yeah. It does happen, <laughs> doesn't it? Sometimes the, the yeah. nice man that you met in the cafe who sold you the yeah. land. Uh, with yeah, the sure. And this romantic scenery and you're looking at it and think, oh, this is and gorgeous so with all happen. these. Yeah. Yes. While, I'm, while we mentioned it, does anybody want to buy an olive field in central Portugal? PM me. <laughs> Um, does 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 location connected to that being in the country? So, uh, does location affect ability to get a mortgage, uh, i.e., Lisbon versus Porto versus Central Portugal? Uh, central being rural. So, does that make a difference if it's a rural, if it's central? What, what's yes. the about that? If you're buying in Porto, Lisbon, or in the Algarve, or anywhere in the middle of that, that's not an issue. But if it's rural, yes, it's not. Some, it's not. Some, there's two things. So, if you're from from abroad, so that's always where the thing comes in you're a different risk as i explained at the start yes. being from abroad and the chance that you default is bigger than when you're not from abroad okay. so the bank keeps that in mind and they're just going to look at the property how easily can we resell this if this client for some reason is not going to pay the mortgage so that's where we have a bit of a hurdle to take however it being rural in itself is not a reason not to approve it but it t- depends again and that's where you need your legal guy or woman again 
um, to make sure that it, it is uh, not a land or a piece of land uh, registered for agricultural business. Because you're not, and again, you can buy, build something on it, but it cannot be more than a shed for your tools. Yes. So you just have a legal issue that you're buying where, yeah. where the banks don't want to be part of that. Understood. Okay, so cosmopolitan might be a little easier, uh, metropolitan. And at that point, may we recommend our excellent uh, lawyer that we love, the Lisbon lawyer himself, uh, Daniel Reyes of Reyes and Pelicano, who we yeah, know brilliant. in the community. Yeah. Oh, you know him as well, right? Yeah, yeah, we we've, we had a client uh, together. So he was doing the legal part and I was doing the, the mortgage part and he's uh, absolutely brilliant. So he yes. knows his stuff. He has the same qualities as you, direct and to the point in that Dutch way of yours, uh, Jack. <laughs> Um, he's, he's Portuguese, however. Um, uh, so um, from Vian and Ivan, or Ivan, um, can mortgages be paid off early? Yes, they can. Okay. Um, they can. Uh, there is a big caveat or a good thing to pay attention to. Uh, you will have a penalty paying off early with almost all the banks. And it will, how much the penalty will be depends on if you're in a fixed or variable rate period of your mortgage. So it makes sense to... If you're thinking about it and you're going to be switching to variable rate soon in the term of your mortgage, because there isn't any bank really offering full-time fixed rate offers for, for non-resident buyers, um, then do it then because the penalty is 2% in the fixed rate period and it's only half a percent in the variable rate period. Yep. And that penalty applies to the amount that you're paying back. Okay, excellent. All right. And um, that question, I was wondering, what, what have we not covered tonight? And it's the refinancing one, isn't there it? There it comes. Yeah. yeah, oh, yeah. There it is. Okay. Uh, refinancing property loans, does that happen in Portugal? No. No, simple. No, you cannot. No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no. And there, there is one catch okay. for a rebuild modeling. Yes. But oh, okay. Please, but yeah, then you, again, you need licenses. It's not a guarantee. So anyone who's thinking about buying and thinking like, oh, I'm going to buy in cash because I can't be bothered with the process. I'm going to do that later. Don't do it because you're not going to get the money back out of the property. We've had some people that we had to disappoint and yeah, say no. Yeah. And um, yeah. All right. Excellent. Uh, thank you, everybody, for your prompts and questions. I think we pretty much covered it. Well, I think we have. What about you, Jacqueline? Is there anything I missed that you that we must record? Uh, we must uh, mention in this part of the recording? Mm. No, well, I just said the most important thing, talk to us early if you're thinking about it. Um, we can't guarantee timelines, we can't guarantee rates, but we can guarantee that, you know, we'll be there next to you holding your hand and trying to make it as uh, understandable as possible. Uh, so I think that's uh, something good to take away. That, uh, well, yeah, I, I, that's what we love in all of our associates at Expats Portugal is you can't, you're not miracle workers in the sense of, you know, there are certain forces beyond your control. But yeah. the ones that you do have control over, you'll be there working with, with the people in question and the clients. Yeah. 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 And, and we get surprises too every day. And we were in the business daily and for seven years already in Portugal, 17 years. I mean, in between the whole team of us, of all the people part of Mortgage Rec, we have more than, we have 200 years of mortgage experience. So we kind of know what we're talking about. You know, really, uh, we have good experience. People who are all also recognized by the banks of Portugal or by the Bank of Spain in the other sense. We all have either country, uh, how do you call them, certificates as well. We have the CMAP that you have in the UK. So there's a lot of regulation going on within our business. And we're always really making sure that we are um, doing it correctly and that we're recognized by the bodies that, uh, yeah, that, that establish if you're capable of doing this, basically. I was going to pause the recording there or end the recording there, but this just in, hold the front page. Does This is important. Does time in the country matter? Uh, one to two years as a resident for Rory, I believe. So how, how will that affect the application? Well, the question there that I would ask directly to Rory, Rory it was, um, right. if you are a resident from, you're registered at the municipality and you've been renting a property, for example, does not make you per se a tax resident from the bank's point of view. Uh -huh. So they still look at what is the source of your income, because that's the main factor to, to grant your mortgage or not. And they're going to look at where's your income generated. So let's say you're still earning US dollars, but you're declaring them in Portugal. You're considered more a tax resident than someone who is not declaring it in Portugal. Yes. If for some reason you have it figured out and you're still declaring in your home country, then um, you would not be considered a 
tax resident from the bank's point of view, although you've been living in the prop in the country. You give a bit more of this vibe that you're probably going to stay and going to, you know, that, that risk is kind of uh, reduced, but it's still, um, where is your income coming from? That's the determining factor to consider you as a resident or not resident from the bank's point of view. Very good. Thank you for that, Rory. And uh, I think we're going to stop the recording there. Suffice to say, um, if you want to get in touch with Jacqueline, do that via our business directory. The link is in the chat or drop her a line, jm at mortgage direct sl. Don't forget the sl.com. And uh, Jacqueline, I'll get right back to you uh, from, from that email. Thank you very much. Excellent stuff, Jacqueline. My pleasure. It was really lovely to be here with everyone. I like that people are so excited and asking questions. It really shows a genuine interest and I think that that's the, also the best way we can work together that, you know, um, that we can make it happen and that we can uh, get the mortgage in place. So thanks for having us. Thanks for having us, Astrid, Paul, Jerry. <laughs> Jerry. Thank you.